So, this is The Legend of Korra, Season 4, Episode 6, The Battle of Zaofu. So, I got one prediction right. This episode totally consisted of The Battle of Zaofu. Maybe next time I should look at an episode list before I start making predictions. Not likely. Um, so, kind of the big action set piece in this episode was Korra fighting Kuvira. It was a pretty decent fight. Korra kind of got her ass kicked, which was not what I was expecting. I was expecting there to be some kind of a trick. Maybe Korra beats Kuvira down, but she parlays that into something politically. Maybe Kuvira has some kind of trap set up for Korra. But no, it was basically... Kuvira was supremely confident, Korra was out of practice, and flinched when she went into the Avatar stage, which again, I was not expecting them to go back to that well, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Kuvira is very Korra-like in her mannerisms, in her approach to problems. She's very similar to Season 1 Korra. Very headstrong, very determined to use force, very certain that she's right. You know, I kind of see what they're doing here. Korra's reluctant to fight her because she recognizes herself in her. Which is neat. It's, it's always neat when you have a villain who reflects the flaws of the hero. It's become pretty commonplace these days, but it's, it's a cute thing to do, and it's not precisely something that, has, that the show has done before. Certainly, Ozai does not reflect Aang's flaws. None of the previous Korra villains really particularly reflect Korra's flaws. So this this is a well they haven't gone to before, and I think it, it works. The closest they've come to it before, actually, is in Season 1 of Avatar The Last Airbender, when Zuko was still the primary villain, and he very much does represent kind of Aang's counterpart. So that kind of circling back to the beginning, which is a nice thing to do in your final season. The other interesting thing I noticed about that battle was the use of the metal bending. The particular way in which Kuvira fought was very familiar. Uh, if you watch the fight, watch what she's doing, she's trying to get metal bands around Kuvira, Korra's arms and legs so that she can then control Korra's limbs. It's a very particular way of fighting that's very reminiscent of something we've seen before, it's actually very much like bloodbending. You know, taking control of your opponent's limbs in order to prevent them from bending at you. I mean, that, that is basically how Hama fought back in the first series, how, you know, Amon fought later on. That's how bloodbending works. Kind of makes you wonder if Kuvira learned to fight from Sue, who learned to fight from Toph, did Toph get some tips from Katara? I mean, yeah, Katara was determined to, for, that bloodbending would die with her, but it's also very obvious that it didn't, given what happened with, you know, Amon's dad. So, maybe she did give some suggestions to Toph on how to fight against bloodbenders, which Toph then used to help develop the metal bending art that she taught? Who knows? Point is, it's it's an interesting little way of circling back again to the beginning. It circles back, in this case, the beginning is the first season of Korra, as opposed to the first season of Avatar The Last Airbender, but still, that's a beginning that we're circling back to by referencing that style of fighting. Also, holy cow, once again we see airbenders are terrifying when they let themselves go. Those two kids... Pretty sure only one of whom is a master, but those two kids created a tornado capable of stymieing an army for a significant period of time. You know, the Mecha would have eventually gotten them, but they still held off an entire army for at least several minutes. That is pretty impressive for two people to do. Once again, we see that if not for its non-aggressive philosophy, airbenders would be the most dangerous benders. They are scary. Speaking of scary, 
Varric is kind of terrifying in this episode. I kept... I keep thinking he's bluffing when he's not, is my problem. I keep not believing him, underestimating how scary he can be. I thought the Julie thing was a trick. It's looking like it wasn't. I still think Julie is going to, in some way, flip-flop back to the good guys by the end of the ser series, but I do think she actually was genuine in switching sides away from Varric, at least temporarily. So I was wrong about that last time. That much is clear from this episode. Varric building a bomb right under the nose of his uh, captors did not see that coming. He has some impressive cojones on him. So he and Bolin are able to escape. Bolin is already massively exasperated with him, which is cute. Um... That is one heck of an explosion they produced. It is increasingly looking like the spirit vines are going to be the basically nuclear weapons of this fantastic World War II that we're building up into. Unfortunately, as is often the case in fantastic World War II's, in order to make things more black and white, the nuclear weapons go to the bad guys, as opposed to going to the less bad guys of the real world, World War II. <sighs> so, on the other hand, that does mean Bolin is not going to a re-education camp. It looks like if we do follow characters to a re-education camp, it'll actually be Sue's family, which will be interesting. This may be a way to bring uh, Lin Beifong into the story, or even Toph. Seeing Toph liberate, liberate a concentration camp would be pretty awesome. But we'll see what happens. I'm really hoping she comes back more, but I basically want every episode to be all Toph all the time in the Toph show. So probably not going to get as much of her as I want. Other than that, I mean, this was basically a pretty straightforward episode. A lot of stuff happened. Um, but now... You know, Kuvira is in charge of the Earth Kingdom, which means now she has to find a new enemy, because as I have mentioned a couple of times, a fascist state requires an enemy to function. And, yeah, I think that's about it. That's, that's really all we've got in this episode. It was a good episode. It wasn't a very complicated episode. Um, mostly some action scenes and the Varric and Bolin show which, not quite as good as the Toph show, but I'd tune in for more of it. Right now, what I'm expecting to happen next is probably Kuvira starts immediately moving towards either Republic City or the Fire Nation, probably Republic City. Continues developing the spirit cannons, or whatever they end up being called. And... We get an episode or two of Korra once again having to figure out how to get her powers working. Um, I feel like that's a well they've gone to enough times at this point. I'm, I'm a little frustrated with it. I wish they had found a better way to resolve that fight. But, you know, what can you do? Korra in the Avatar state is basically as powerful as a nuke. You know, kind of on her own. She could have taken out that whole army, probably. So, the writers are in a little bit of a corner, you know. It's the Superman problem. It is very hard to have an interesting fight in terms of raw power of Superman versus whatever, because he's Superman. The way you make it interesting is by adding in extra elements. Either, you know, the simplest way is to put limitations on him, throw in some kryptonite or something, but the more interesting way is to have him have to protect someone who's much more fragile than him. You know, that's why Lois Lane is such an important character. Um, first of all, because she's awesome on her own, but even put that aside, people like Lois Lane and Jimmy Olsen and so on exist so that Superman has someone he has to protect, so that he can't just instant win every fight ever, because he has to worry about what happens to them. In a broader sense, you know, 
and couldn't go into the Avatar state whenever he wanted to because the collateral damage terrified him. Korra doesn't care much about collateral damage, so finding a way to limit her is a little bit more of a challenge, and unfortunately the way the writers of the show have normally done it these past four seasons is by taking her powers away, where I think with a little bit more creativity and interest, I, I, hopefully they will do this soon, come up with some way of limiting her so she doesn't instantly win by going into the Avatar state, but at the same time, it isn't, oh, she's lost her powers, oh, she's internally conflicted, etc., etc., because enough. Have her get over it already. It is a very repetitive story. It might be quote-unquote realistic, but realism is overrated. I want an interesting story. I don't want the exact same thing we just had for the past Honestly, three seasons, because most of season two is about her losing her powers and getting them back again, or losing her memories and getting them back again, or however you want to put it. And then season three, season four now, you know, lose her powers, get them back again, lose them again. Just, you know, someone needs to invent therapy in this world. But that's me being, I think, a little bit harsher on this episode than I actually feel. Um, this is still way better than season two. This is, you know, still not as good as season three, but I'm enjoying it. And, again, we'll see what happens. Hopefully we'll build up to something. Also, need more Asami, need more Toph. Maybe some more Tenzin, haven't seen him in a while. Yeah, that'll about do it for me. Talk to you all later.